Mackenzie, what are you doing now? Well, Sergeant, I'm uh, putting in a little bit of extra practice. You see, uh, Corporal Ross said last night that when Mr. McDonald did the grand rounds last night, well, he turned the guard out, and uh, their drill wasn't very good. Uh, well, I'm on guard tonight, so, well, I wanted to prevent some extra drill, if you know what I mean. So I thought I'd put a little bit of time in and practice some of my basic movements. Mackenzie. So that when Mackenzie. Mackenzie's just, uh, have you seen anyone else in full dress this morning? Uh, well, no, Sergeant, I haven't. Everybody's in their service dress this morning, and while there's a lot of activity around, I wonder why that is. It's because we're mobilizing. Now get away, get into your service dress. Ammunition will be issued within the hour. Then we parade to catch the train at 11 o'clock. I suggest you move quickly. We're going to have work to do. Well, is that why the lamps were going out all over? The effect of the Boer War on the British Army had been profound, and at its conclusion there had been a comprehensive period whereby nearly all aspects of Army business had felt the effect. A new universal khaki service dress was adopted, new personal equipment in first the 1903 pattern bandolier equipment and then the 1908 pattern web equipment supplanted the buff leather Slade Wallace set, finally relegating that material to ceremonial use only, and a new rifle, the short magazine Lee Enfield was introduced as a universal weapon used by the whole army, infantry, cavalry or otherwise. Foot drill changed too. The panoply of movements that had been used by generations of soldiers was modified and simplified. All of this pointed to a break, subtle at first, from a universal application of dress and drill, be it in garrison or in the field, to an ever-increasing separation as it pertained to barracks-based routine and ceremonial duties and field-based movement on the battlefield. At Magers Fontaine, the Highland Brigade had been wrongly kept in close column until far too close to the enemy, and had paid the price. In the post-Boer War Army, the lessons of dispersion and extension relegated these somewhat old-fashioned evolutions to administrative or ceremonial acts, rather than them being used as battlefield tactics. The infantry manual and its appendices of 1905 saw a massive reduction in the number of movements incorporated within the rifle exercises. The slope would become the way the rifle was carried on the move for all occasions, notwithstanding the continued use of the shoulder and trail by rifle regiments. These changes would be perpetuated by the 1914 edition. We see in the early years of the 20th century a change in the style of drill with arms that would carry on until the issue of the SLR in the 1950s. By this time, however, drill would become increasingly infused with embellishment and showmanship. For the first decade after the Boer War, these elements were yet to take hold and the same type of workmanlike style as exhibited in the Victorian era would still be applied. There was no stamping of feet or lifting the knee to any great extent, and the arms were swung in an almost casual or practical way. Other elements changed as well. A new way of standing at ease was adopted, coupled with a new style of turning at the halt. All these elements were well in force by 1914. The first position taught was the position of order arms, or standing to attention with arms. Used as a transition between the relaxed stand at ease to other movements, it was also used to convey respect when addressing or in the presence of those of higher rank. The man stood square to the front with his heels together and feet apart at approximately 45 degrees. His legs were straight and the rifle was held with the butt at the small toe of the right foot. The right hand held the rifle at the band while the left hand was held in the customary loose fist with the fingers touching the side of the thigh. The shoulders were square and the head and eyes straight to the front. The position of stand at ease was to enable the man to relax while on parade. As mentioned earlier, it was of a relatively new style. Whereas in the Victorian era, the right foot had been drawn back behind the left. Now the feet remained square, with a gap of approximately 10 inches between the heels. The rifle was held at an extension of the right arm to the front. 
The position was the same, whether bayonets were fixed or unfixed. This was in contrast to the Victorian version, whereby there were two ways to stand at ease, depending on the fixing of the bayonet. The position of slope arms followed on from earlier adaptations introduced with the Lee Metford back in the 1890s. The magazine of the then new rifle forced a change to that having the rifle placed flat on the shoulder rather than upright as it had been with earlier weapons. Post-Boer War, the slope continued its ascendancy from a somewhat utilitarian movement to become the universal way in which the weapon was carried both in routine, ceremonial, and also field use. Whereas in the 1890s there had been five ways to carry the rifle, namely the shoulder, the advance, the slope, the trail, and the port. Now there was only one, the slope, with the trail reserved for extended order in the field. The slope was used in slow, quick, and double time. As mentioned, its use was universal, and this applied equally to operations conducted in the field. In the days before mechanization, the infantry had to move about the battlefield on its feet. A great deal of this movement would be conducted in close order, marching in fours from A to B before deploying, shaking out into extended order. Although much of this could be done while marching at ease, with the rifle being held in any way comfortable, the slope was ubiquitous in these circumstances. Here we see images taken during the coronation parade of King George V. These various formed bodies of troops lining the streets are coming to the slope in preparation to present arms. It was also the position from which compliments were paid. A salute was rendered by the right hand being placed flat against the butt of the rifle. For more formal compliments, the present was used. Royalty general officers, colors, and the like, were all individuals or objects warranted to receive such a salute. It would have been used by sentries, the guard, as well as on parade to receive dignitaries and pay compliments to armed bodies of men passing by. The trail was used in a somewhat more limited role than it had been in the past. By 1914, its use had been focused on field movements in extended order. The regulation goes so far as to stipulate that the trail is not to be used in close order drill, notwithstanding its use in this capacity by rifle regiments. The trail was used in quick and in double time. The use of the position of port arms was also somewhat diminished. Generally, it was used for the inspection of the rifle on parade, with a bolt being opened to facilitate this. Its use during century changing evolutions had been a feature for generations, but by 1914 this had been simplified by the use of the slope. Another such movement was the on guard. In Victorian times this had been known as the charge bayonets, and had featured in the formal delivery of the charge as well as in a century challenging evolution. In the Edwardian era this had become a position that was mostly related to bayonet fighting than anything else. The details of this movement were not contained in the text of the rifle exercises, but rather in the section on bayonet fighting. In this video, I've included the evolution of the on guard due to its inclusion in some of these ceremonial sentry duties. If the minutia of the SMLE rifle exercises isn't quite to your liking, then I invite you to skip forward to the 23 minute and 30 second mark, where there will be a short conclusion and some historical notes. Movements from the order. Stand at ease from the order. Stand at ease. On the word of command, stand at ease, the left foot was drawn away approximately 10 inches from the right. The foot was kept low to the ground and the knee was not excessively bent. Simultaneous to this, the rifle was thrust out to a relaxed extension of the right arm. On the word of command, attention, the left foot was drawn back to the right, the heels coming together and the feet reassuming their 45 degree position in relation to each other. 
Simultaneous to this, the rifle was drawn back to the position of attention. The evolution of fixing bayonets was a rather complicated affair, involving more than one man. The individual evolution will be shown first, and then the collective evolution. Fix bayonets. Two. Three. On the word of command bayonets, the right hand thrust the rifle out to an extension of the right arm. Simultaneous to this, the left hand moved to a position, gripping the hilt of the bayonet with the thumb. The elbow was kept as close to the body as possible. In addition, as these movements are completed, the head and eyes were turned to the right. More on that later. In the second part, the left hand drew the bayonet out of the scabbard and fixed it to the nose cap of the rifle. And in the third part, the hands were drawn back to the position of attention and the head and eyes turned to the front. As mentioned, the evolution of fixing bayonets was a collective one. On the word of command fix, the right hand man of a formed body of troops took three paces to the front. Fix! Then, on the word of command bayonets, bayonets. everyone executed the first part of the movement, the exception of the right hand man being that he turned his head and eyes to the left. Following this, the timing for the subsequent parts was taken from this right-hand man. Once the second part was complete, he raised his left arm out to the front, holding it until the formed body had completely finished the second part. Satisfied that everyone had done so, he then cut both his left hand away and the rifle back to the position of attention. This was the signal for the remainder to do the same. After a pause, he reassumed his position on the right flank by taking three steps to the rear. As with the fix, the unfixed bayonets was also a collective evolution. We'll deal with the individual part first. Unfix bayonets. Two. Three. Four. On the word of command bayonets, the rifle was brought to a position between the heels, with the knee slightly bent, gripping it. Immediately subsequent, the left hand was moved to a position to disengage the bayonet catch on the hilt of the bayonet, and the right hand gripped the hilt. As the catch was released, the hilt was raised approximately one inch off the stud. As this was accomplished, the head and eyes were turned to the left. In the second part, the left hand quit the rifle and moved to a position, gripping the scabbard. Simultaneous to this, the right hand assumed control of the bayonet, and inserted the tip into the scabbard. The bayonet at this point was not fully secured, and remained partially out of the scabbard. In the third part, the right hand forced the bayonet fully home in the scabbard, and then reassumed a position at the barrel band of the rifle. The left hand remained on the scabbard, and the head and eyes remained to the left. In the fourth part, the rifle and body reassumed the position of attention. As discussed, this was a collective evolution. On the word of command unfix, the left-hand man of a formed body of troops moved forward three paces. On the word of command bayonets, the whole executed the first part of the movement, the exception being that the left-hand man turned his head and eyes to the right. There is some evidence to suggest, as shown here, that the bayonet was removed by the left marker and held at arm's length for all to see at the end of the first part, instead of simply removing it with a flourish, as I have done here, at the beginning of the second. Taking the time from the left-hand man, the subsequent parts were executed. The left-hand man, during the second part, forced his bayonet fully home immediately. Following this, he raised his right arm, as he lowered his right arm, the third part of the movement was executed by the remainder. Again, taking the time from the left-hand man, the whole executed part four and reassumed the position of attention. After a pause, the left-hand man moved back to his position, taking three paces to the rear.
Slope arms from the order. Slope arms. Two. Three. On the word of command arms, the rifle was thrown up with the right hand, caught with the left just below the barrel band. The right hand assumed a position at the small of the butt with the fingers together, canted underneath the back of the bolt. In the second part, the right hand assumed control of the weapon, moving it and placing it flat on the left shoulder. Simultaneous to this, the left hand quit its grip at the barrel band and moved to a position at the butt of the rifle with the thumb around the toe. In the third part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. Order arms from the slope. Order arms. Two. Three. On the word of command arms, the left arm was straightened, dropping the rifle off of the shoulder to a position perpendicular to the ground. Simultaneous to this, the right hand came across and caught the weapon at the barrel band. In the second part, the right hand assumed control of the weapon. Simultaneous to this, the left hand quit the butt and gripped the rifle at the nose cap, or the bayonet hilt as the case may be. This had the effect of steadying the rifle at the right hand side. In the third part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention, and the butt was lowered quietly to the ground. Port arms from the order. The position of the port was used, as discussed, for the inspection of arms. For inspection, port arm. On the word of command, arms, the rifle was thrown up across the front of the body, assuming an angle of 45 degrees. It was caught with the left hand below the back sight, and the right hand gripped the small of the butt. The right hand then immediately moved the safety catch forward and opened the bolt, re-gripping the butt just behind the handle. It's important to note that, as of 1914, all SMLEs had cutoffs. This was to be opened before the bolt was drawn back. Ease springs from the port. Ease springs! On the word of command springs, the right hand gripped the bolt handle, cycling the bolt back and forth multiple times to ensure the magazine was empty. Any rounds therein were ejected onto the ground. The cutoff, if present, was shut. Then the bolt closed and the trigger pressed. Lastly, the safety catch was pulled to the rear and the hand reassumed its position at the small of the butt. Order arms from the port. Order! Arms. Two. Three. On the word of command arms, the right hand came across and gripped the weapon just above the barrel band. In the second part, the right hand assumed control of the rifle, bringing it down to the right hand side in the position of attention. The left hand simultaneously steadied the weapon at the nose cap. In the third part, the left hand was cut away to the position of attention. Trail arms from the order. Trail! On the word of command arms, with a flick of the right wrist, the rifle was thrown up, parallel to the ground, and gripped at the point of balance. Order arms from the trail. Order arms! On the word of command arms, the right hand choked up on the rifle, allowing the butt to drop, where it was placed quietly on the ground in the position of attention. The on guard from the order. On guard! On the word of command, on guard, the rifle was thrown up with the right hand, gripped with the left in front of the magazine and the right at the small of the butt, with the bayonet oriented to a man's chest. Simultaneous to this, the left foot was drawn forward to achieve a good, balanced position. Order arms from the on guard. Order! Arms! On the word of command, arms, the right hand quit the small of the butt, gripped the rifle at the barrel band, and drew the rifle back to the position of attention. Simultaneous to this, the left foot was drawn back and the body rotated back, square to the front, with the left hand being cut away. Movements from the slope. Present arms from the slope. Present arms. 
Two. Three. On the word of command, arms, the right hand came across and gripped the small of the butt. In the second part, the right hand assumed control of the weapon, bringing it off the shoulder, maintaining its orientation with the magazine to the left, where the left hand struck the sling just before the magazine. In the third part, the rifle was dropped to the fullest extent of the right hand, which changed its grip from an all-around grip of the wrist to a flat open style with the fingers straight. The rifle was twisted so the magazine pointed straight to the front and the left hand assumed an all-around grip with the thumb uppermost around the sling and forestock. Simultaneous to this, the right foot was drawn back to a position whereby its instep was in line with the left heel. Slope arms from the present. Slope arms! Two! On the word of command arms, the right hand assumed control of the weapon, bringing it to the position of the slope arms on the left shoulder at a 45 degree angle. Simultaneous to this, the left hand quit its grip around the sling and forestock and moved to its position at the butt of the rifle with the thumb about the toe. Simultaneous to this, the right foot was brought back to the position of attention. In the second part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. Port arms from the slope. The port was also used in certain ceremonial circumstances. For this reason, I've included the movement from the slope as well. Port arm. Two. On the word of command arms, the right hand came across in a similar fashion to that of the first part of the present. In the second part, the rifle was brought down in front of the body at a 45 degree angle, where the left hand, having quit the butt, gripped the weapon just before the magazine below the backside. Slope arms from the port. Slope arms. Two. On the word of command arms, the right hand assumed control of the rifle, placing it at a 45 degree angle on the left shoulder. Simultaneous to this, the left hand quit the forestock and reassumed its position at the butt of the rifle. In the second part, the right hand was cut away to the position of attention. Change arms from the slope. Change arms. Two. Three. On the word of command arms, the right hand came up and gripped the butt with the top of the hand facing up. Simultaneous to this, the left hand moved to the small of the butt. In the second part, both hands worked together to rotate and move the rifle to the right shoulder with the magazine pointed out. In the third part, the left hand was cut away. The same process was used only in reverse to bring the weapon back to the left shoulder. Two. Three. Attention. So you can see that when compared to the manual exercises of the Victorian era, the rifle exercises of 1914 were greatly simplified. This evolution went hand in hand with the changes in tactical thinking and ethos within the army. The effect of the Boer War had been profound and was felt in almost all aspects of army training. In this new 20th century, it was seemingly felt that the complexity and pedanticness of 19th century drill simply wasn't needed, and as a result, only the bare minimum number of movements were kept. This didn't preclude any ceremonial aspects, however. The army was still able to conduct the many and varied evolutions, from simple posting of sentries to trooping the color with the new exercise. Of course, despite the tactical innovations put forth by the lessons learned in South Africa, drill was, as it is to a degree today, a valuable tool in introducing, teaching, molding, and polishing what one might call military efficiency. Teamwork, obedience, posture, bearing and pride were all manifest on the square. Qualities that the BEF of 1914 had in spades. Trail! Arch! By the right, quick march! I'd like to mention a couple of historical notes on this video. The uniforms worn represent those used by the Seaforth Highlanders on the eve of the Great War. Driven by the reality of the Boer War, the army made numerous changes to the way it conducted business. 
the whitened buff leather equipment known as the Slade Wallace or 1888 set was replaced in all units but the guards starting from 1903. The brown leather and the bandolier of the 1903 equipment did not match the bright scarlet and polished brass of the army's traditional dress. So as units were issued with their new equipment and turned in their Slade Wallace, the waist belt, frog, and often a single ammunition pouch were kept for use in full dress. The peculiar pattern of doublet for the Seaforth Highlanders in 1914 had been in service from about the 1900 mark, albeit with a slight modification. At this time, petitions were made all across the army for regiments to regain their old traditional colored facings and move away from the imposed national facings as directed in 1881. When the regiment was formed in that year, an amalgamation of the 72nd and 78th Highlanders, it used the universal Scottish facing color of yellow, which was seen as a disappointment to those that had been more familiar with the old 78th facing of buff. This was realized in 1900 when permission was granted to readopt the buff of the antecedent regiment. Initially, this was worn on the cuffs and collar only, but a small change was made in 1913 with the army-wide readoption of colored shoulder straps. Thus, the doublet of 1914 would be the last iteration of full dress issued generally to the regiment and indeed the entire army. All the hallmarks have been included here to represent Seaforth full dress of 1914. The feather bonnet with white hackle, the scarlet doublet with buff facings on cuff, collar and shoulder strap, whitened buff leather Slade Wallace belt and frog, a Seaforth pattern hairsporn and kilt of number two Mackenzie tartan, attached to the rear of the doublet and around the waist by a simple cord, is what is known as a fly, which was a piece of tartan worn as an accoutrement to mimic the old Philomore or great kilt with its voluminous upper dimensions. Red and white Menzies hose tops, and of course the SMLE with bayonet, which would have been a Mark III in 1914 and not the Mark III star, as I have. With the coming of the Great War, full dress was ordered to be returned to stores as the army mobilized for active service. The economic reality after the war would see full dress not reintroduced except for the Brigade of Guards, notwithstanding the use of old garments pulled from stores for special occasions or tattoos. Gradually, these stocks of uniforms that had once clothed the army in its traditional colors were used up, never to be replaced. Ever in need to display a best uniform, the armies of the empire would increasingly dress up their service dress with the white leather and accoutrements of full dress in an effort to redeem some smartish quality for ceremonial work. The army wouldn't again have a general issue ceremonial uniform until the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953, when blue patrol dress was enshrined as number one dress. Scottish regiments received their own versions in either the green coatee for Highland regiments or the blue doublet for Lowland. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. Mackenzie! Mackenzie! Have you seen anyone else in full dress this morning? Oh, cat. The savage wee beastie.